All right, have you ever wanted a coherent, articulate rundown about what the socio-political landscape of post-primordial Central South America was like in the 1900s? Because that's what this is. Don't worry though, I promise this will not be a banal story, because today I'm going to evince and exhume the murky truth about the Banana Republics. The tale of the Banana Republics begins at the start of the 1900s in the halcyon days of Central and South America. Small verdant plantations are booming all around with a penchant to sell things such as sugar and particularly bananas. Agricultural commerce could not have been better, but then refrigeration happened and everything really got real. Fruit grown on the plantations could now be stored and kept for much longer, allowing fruit companies to ship internationally, most importantly to the, to the United States. Three companies were substantiated among this, amongst this maelstrom caused by the frenetic rush for power. The United Fruit Company, the Coyamel Fruit Company, and the Vaccaro Brothers. With great celerity, the three fruit companies started expanding. Due to their propinquity and massive budgets, they irrigated smaller plantations until their only competition was each other, and in the end, the three pecuniary companies made absolutely ludicrous amounts of money. Summarily, their power was consummated. One particular individual, Sam Zamuri, was the founder of Coyamel. His actions were instrumental in establishing the term and stereotype that would later be known as the Banana Republics. In 1910, the country of Honduras, where Coyamel did most of its business, gave a land grant to the Vicaro brothers, thus cutting into Coyamel's intransigent and insatiable need to take over more land. In a devious plot, the nefarious Samuri conspired with ex-Honduran president Manuel Bonilla, and with the help of a hired esoteric mercenary army, accosted and overthrew the entire freaking government of Honduras. The fruit companies were now even more of a bastion of power than they were before. In a modern-day unwanted act, the United States saw this and turned a blind eye because this was before we all decided we were going to police the governments of other nations. However, even though the companies still thrived, Honduras atrophied to the point where its government couldn't accomplish many of its tasks. Honduras was in a state of utter disarray and had an exigency for help. In response to that, the fruit companies stepped in and, seemingly in an incumbent act of largesse, built almost all the country's infrastructure. This created a credence where the countries gave the companies tax breaks and land in exchange for a modernized infrastructure. This concord was all well and good, but it dissembled the fact that the companies mainly helped so the bananas kept flowing out of Honduras. Many other countries soon followed this practice. This led to the companies now not only having a monopoly over the plantations, but also over the infrastructure of most of the countries of Central South America. Life was all but utopian for the feckless upper 5% of the population under the Banana Republics who owned some sort of share in the plantations or connection to the companies. But for everyone else, you know, your average mundane guy, the very thought of making it out of your depraved, distraught lifestyle was basically a figment of the imagination. You were practically flotsam, incarcerated to work on land that wasn't yours in exchange for dirt poor wages. Pretty sweet, right? Anyway, life continued like this for about a decade and a half. During that time, Coyamel and United Fruit had congealed into one company as United bought them out, but Zemery still somehow remained in charge of the company even though it was still called United. Vaccaro also renamed itself to Standard Fruit. Then in 1944, the country of Guatemala had a democratic revolution. Its new president, Juan José Aravalo, was pretty fed up and groused heavily about the avid and overt mistreatment of his people. So he instituted many reforms, such as minimum wage laws and universal suffrage. When the populace, while the populace got a lot of good things out of it, the fruit companies were anything but jocular over their new leader. After all, more rights and less animate versions from the people means less profit for your fruit companies. Guatemala got a new, pres a new president after that, Jacobo Arvents. United kept getting hit by mordant reform after reform until one day in 1954, they got sick of all the propriety and decided to go to the United States for help. Convinced that Guatemala was participating in communism, President Eisenhower basically wrecked all of Guatemala, and from then on until 1996, the country was ruled by a line of U.S.-backed dictatorships. This happened in other places and times as well, mainly driven by our red fear. Nowadays, these companies are still germane in the food industry. It would be too simple for them to just disappear, wouldn't it? Standard Fruit became known as Dole Food Company, while the invidious United became known as none other than Chiquita Banana. So when you go buy bananas at the grocery store, just remember that what you thought was a humble fruit merchant slash dancer is actually a symbol of an incendiary company that eschews democracy and enervates people's basic human rights. I hope you all enjoyed the story of the Banana Republics, and thank you.